Hello, and um, thank you all for coming to this policy exchange event um, in conversation with Chris Grading, the Justice Secretary and Lord Chancellor. The last time um, PX and I did an event in this room, somebody fainted. Um, so if you uh, if got so hot, so if you, if you, if you feel you're coming, kind of coming over a bit loose headed at any point, just, just shout um, rather than having someone collapse. I think avoid that. Um, Justice Secretary forces fainting fits on Tory members. That might not be the best headline. Um, uh, Chris, uh, I'm sure, needs very little instruction for you. Um, Chris, having been a welfare minister at the start of the coalition, uh, is now the Justice Secretary and the <coughs> Chancellor, and I think kind of one of the most interesting voices on the, on what one might call the reforming right of the Tory party. Um, so Chris, I mean, the kind of first question to you is Justice Secretary. Obviously, the, you know, it used to be the Home Office of everything, and it's now split. You've now got the prisons are part of your domain. Do you think prison works? Uh, I do think prison works. I, I might just say also that you're standing up to two seats at the front if anybody wants to come around <laughs> so I'm talking. Um, the, um, uh, I do think prison works. I, I think prison has two jobs to do. The first it performs effectively, which is to protect the public, to remove people who are a danger to the public from the streets. And you know, if you talk to any police force, they will say to you that uh, if, when the serial burger in the area is behind bars, the burger rate drops, the moment he comes out, the burglary rate goes up again. Um, and therein lies the second part of my answer to the question, which is prison works very well to protect the public. Prison as yet does not work well enough to stop people coming back there. Uh, and that is something that involves us joining up both what happens within prisons and what happens after prisons. Uh, and the big focus of the reforms that we're pushing through in the Ministry of Justice is to try to create a proper through the gate rehabilitation service which ensures that fewer of those people who have got there in the first place come back again. Uh, but uh, the idea that you would not have prison, the idea that you would let large numbers of people who are today in prison out onto the streets, I think is not one society would ex uh, ex accept, nor do I think it's the right thing to do. Uh, and would you say that the test of your success as Justice Secretary will be whether um, the, the, the level of recidivism has reduced at the end of your tenure from the beginning? Um, I think it won't be so much uh, has the recidivism level uh, come down at the end of my tenure, depends how long my tenure is. Uh, but if you were, say, looking ahead to the general election, um, uh, by the time we get to the general election, will we have seen a significant change at that point? No, because the reforms that we're putting in place will not yet uh, or have had the chance to become properly embedded. If you look at what we're doing, we are reshaping the way probation works so that we can concentrate uh, those parts of the, the probation world that should always be in the public sector and will always be in the public sector on the task of looking after and supervising the most dangerous and problematic of offenders. But a greater focus on mentoring and support and through the gate resettlement for those who are lower and medium risk offenders is something that we will be rolling out um, in the run up to the, the, to the election. Um, but it won't have had a chance to bed in. If you said, what is the test of success? It's looking three or four years down the track and saying, has there been a significant change to the number of people reoffending? And that's really the thing will determine whether we succeeded or not. But we start with a, in parts of this world with a blank canvas. If you go to jail for less than 12 months, you will come out of prison with 46 pounds in your pocket and that's it. No support, no guidance, nothing. Uh, and the biggest part, if you look at the reforms that we're pushing through, that is the biggest part of the reform. It's <coughs> taking that group, 45,000 people released from prison each year uh, with no support, uh, and it's giving those people that support for the first time. 12 months supervision, 12 months guidance, 12 months mentoring, <coughs> planning for their release before they walk through the prison gate, having somebody they're already working with alongside them as they walk through the prison gate. That is the only way we're going to make a real difference, and that is where I'm very confident we will see a rapid process of change. Uh, apart from the criminal justice system, probably the biggest issue in your portfolio is old. European Convention on Human Rights, Human Rights Act issue. David Cameron this morning suggested that, that, that the Tories could, next, could go into next section proposing leaving the Convention altogether. Well, where do you stand on that? Well, we are now looking through very carefully at what the right option is for Britain. I mean, the reality is the original Human Rights Convention was written in the 1940s and the 1950s by Conservatives uh, in a world where Stalin was still in <coughs> Russia where you had people being sent to the gulags without trial. It was all about how you tackled those grotesque abuses of human rights. What has happened since then is that the European Court of Human Rights and the jurisprudence, the, the, the legal framework around it, has moved far, far, far away from the original intentions of the people who created it. 
and we now have cases which I find it impossible <coughs> to find. Um, we don't have the death penalty in this country. Uh, in my view, it's always been right that we don't have the death penalty in this country because we have an imperfect criminal justice system. Uh, and I don't believe you could put people in a position where we might execute them and then find we got it wrong later. But the quid pro quo for that is we should be able to send people to jail for the rest of their lives without the possibility of release. And we have a very small number of offenders, at 40 or 50, who are in that category today, who should never be released. And we have the European Court saying, no, sorry, that's not okay. You've got to give those people the prospect of release and a review in their sentence. That's something which I think is, is out with the remit of the court to decide. Uh, it is a matter for a national parliament. I think they've got it wrong. Um, we came within a very small margin, one vote, in a vote of 15 judges, um, which would have required us to accept US-style TV advertising. Um, it was charity went to the court saying they should be able to political, political advertising. It. Um, they should be able to, to run political advertising in the UK. Now we've never done that because we've always tried to protect the little guy against the big guy. If you've got deep pockets and you can buy endless TV advertising, you've got much more electoral power than if you're not able to do that. So we've always had a ban on political advertising on television, and I think that's right. And it's certainly not for a European court to tell us that we should do it differently, we should run our democracy differently. So all of this has got to change. So the position we're in now um, is we have very clearly committed, and I will commit again in my speech tomorrow, that we as a party will go into the next election with an absolutely clear plan for change. We'll have a variety of options. It is certainly a possibility we have considered whether the right thing to do is to withdraw from the convention altogether. We're looking at other options as well. We've got a detail, quite a skilled team of parliamentarians with legal expertise and external legal advisors working with us. And we'll produce a strategy document in the new year. And then next year, later next year, we'll produce draft legislation. But there will be an absolutely clear plan for change. You've been close enough to this issue for, for, for such a long time, you're a shadow head section for the election. You must have a personal preference for, for, for what you instinctively think would be the answer. I mean, it, it seems to me that the, the problems that you are talking about with the way the court operates are so fundamental, but nothing short of leaving the jurisdiction of the court is, is going to change what you want to change. Well, and there, there are a number of preconditions. I mean, as, as people remind me, it's the first um, uh, Lord Chancellor for about 500 years not to be a lawyer. Uh, you never second-guess the lawyers before you've got the advice properly, uh, and that's really what we're doing. We're working through a number of different issues. Uh, we have to look at the issues around devolution, which were highlighted in the Commission uh, on Human Rights, which the Coalition set up a couple of years ago. Uh, we have to look at the implications of change for things like the, the Good, Good Friday Agreement in Northern Ireland. So we've got to do the job properly, uh, and I want the document and the strategy and the draft bill we come up with be things that command legal respect. Um, but there are some principles, I've said, that we've got to, we, we, we've got to limit the role of the European Court of Human Rights in the UK at least. Um, we've got to have a measure that balances rights and responsibilities. You know, I know my rights, but I have no responsibilities. It's not an acceptable position for our society, in my view. Um, uh, we need to replace Labour's Human Rights Act, which contains some significant flaws. Uh, and I want our Supreme Court to be supreme. How, how can you do that without leaving the Well, there, and you're going to have to hang on to it, produce the strategy document. This is both a legal and a political debate, um, but we will set out the first part of next year a pretty clear plan for change. And we'll take that to the ballot box both at the European elections next year, but also for the general election. And I think it's a big dividing line for us as a party. Um, if you look back at the Labour conference, Sadiq Khan, my, my, my counterpart in the Labour Party, made a very clear statement to support for the Human Rights Act in its current form. The Lib Dems passed a resolution opposing changes to the human rights framework. So this is a genuine dividing issue for the election, where the public's on our side, uh, and we will have a definite plan to sell on the doorsteps. On to another question about this, Europe. Well, when you, David Cameron today said he wants to kind of end ever closer union. Um, as kind of one of the leading Eurosceptics in the party, do you, do you have a sense of of where Britain's relationship, what kind of membership of the EU you could go out and campaign for in 2017? Well, it, it, I think the position we're in is that, rightly or wrongly, uh, much of the rest of the EU has chosen to follow a path of integration uh, that we've seen with the creation of the Eurozone, the move towards, much closer towards a banking union, the measures that have been taken in the wake of the Eurozone crisis. They are following a path that we're not going to be following. In the justice area, uh, I mean, one of the, uh, I don't pay tribute to the last government for many things, 
But one of the things they did do for us, which was a positive, is at least they secured for us in the Lisbon Treaty an opt-out <coughs> for all the Justice and Home Affairs measures. Because there is a very clear intent in Brussels to create a, a, a European justice area with common laws, uh, with common punishments where they're achievable. Um, uh, we even had uh, senior figures in the Commission calling for a European justice minister. Now this is not a path we're going down. Uh, and so there is, a, there is a move in the European Union to move towards uh, greater integration. We're not going to be following that path, which is the point David Cameron's making. We've got to move off that. That requires us to look at governance issues. Uh, and I think George Osborne has done a very good job already securing a safety lock for us in some of the financial services regulations. We've got to look at the whole nature of our relation in governance terms, in terms of the, 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 the types of legislation that are passed in Brussels and apply to the UK, and David Cameron's rightly talked about repatriating powers in the employment area. Uh, I think you know, when we come to put this, if we win the election, we're able to carry out the, uh, the renegotiation and able to put all of this to the British public, then they are going to want to see a change to our relationship with the European Union that maintain, maintains our position, uh, I think, as uh, a, a collaborative international partner, but not part of a move towards what becomes increasingly a, a single unitary European state. Uh, and that, I think, will be the debate that happens when the, the, the time comes for the referendum. And we've got to make sure that we are on the right side of the argument, but we've also delivered a genuine, a genuine package that that people can form a view about whether it's the right thing or not for Britain. You say form a view because at, at the moment the Cameron strategy is to, is, if, if he wins, the, if he's Prime Minister after the next election, to renegotiate and the whole referendum. He has <coughs> uh, said that if he can get the kind of deal he would like, the Tory party as a whole would, would campaign for Britain to stay in the European Union. What, what do you think he's needed to persuade most Tory members and people in this room here today to go and knock on doors and say to people, I think you should vote that we Britain stays in the EU? Well, I think you know, if you said to most Conservative supporters, and actually an awful lot of people in this country, what they voted to do is a common market. We still see the attractions of being part of a single market where you can do business across Europe uh, unfettered by unnecessary regulatory barriers. What people don't want to become part of is this process of, or to be part of this ever pro process of ever closer union. And I think that's where the dividing debate comes. And it's what kind of relationship. So you want kind of common market? And well, I think, if, I think that if you look at it's what I think the public wants. The public wants to be part of a single market. They don't want to be part of the United States of Europe. And what David Cameron said this morning about ever closer union is that if the rest of the European Union is on a path towards much greater integration, the United Kingdom isn't going to be on that path. And if we are going to be part of the European Union in the future, we have to establish a basis which allows us to be there without having a sort of conveyor belt to where none of us believe we should be going. You are you stated the need for more veto moments from David Cameron if, if the Tories are, are going to win the next election. What would be your candidates for a few veto moments coming up? Well, I think the what it doesn't mean is lots of vetoes of European treaties. The point about uh, what I said about EU veto moments is that if we we will win the next election if we bring together a disparate group of voters behind us. And that means making sure that we engage those people on the right who feel strongly about issues like human rights in the European Union uh, and immigration. It also means we reach out to floating voters who are concerned about health, education, cost of living and so forth. But actually cost of living concerns go across the piece. Um, David Cameron, I think, when he came back from Brussels, having vetoed a treaty, the first leader to do so, there was a moment in which the country, and particularly people who are naturally on the right, said, good on him, that's great. Uh, and our poll rating moved to 40%. Uh, and at that point, I think we, we demonstrated to a wide range of voters that we were on their side. And I think that what we need to do over the next 18 months is through a mix of the things that we do, we need to weld together that 40%. Uh, and what I mean by veto moments is things that make people on both sides, the floating voter and the, uh, uh, the, floating voter and the, um, uh, the person who is uh, tempted away to other political climbs on the right, say, oh, actually, these guys are on the right track, I'm fine. Now, I hope that the publication of a draft bill on human rights will be a reassurance to some right-wing supporters who are a little bit wobbly. Um, I think that some of the things we're doing, I mean, if you take the announcement today about the Help to Buy scheme, yeah, there are lots of parents and 
young people in their 20s today having conversations about how they get on the housing ladder. How do you get on the housing ladder if you have to raise a quarter of the price of a house? Well, tens of thousands of pounds, how on earth do you save that kind of money? The help to buy a scheme will make a real difference, and my hope is that you know, actually in the next few days there's a lot of those families going to sit down and say, hey, actually we can, we can now help you find the 5% deposit and you can buy your house. It's going to be moments where we do things that are bold and make people sit back and say, oh, you guys are really on our side, they're saying what I want to say. Do you think there's a tension between winning back voters who've gone over to the UK and then doing what you need to do if you're going to win a majority, which is converting people who voted for Labour in 2010? I think the trick is to, um, to make sure that we've actually got something for everyone, that we actually understand the needs. And there are some things that are common to, to, to all the voters we need. Concern about the NHS, for example. Jeremy Hunt, I think, is doing a really good job in highlighting some of the areas that we want to see NHS improvement. That affects all of the people in my constituency, no matter who they're for. Um, uh, we've got to make sure that we have messages that recognise the challenges that people face across the piece. But we've also got to have messages that engage at both ends of the spectrum. It's, 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 yeah. If you want to go up, I'll come back to the human rights issue again. The human rights issue is a very good way of engaging some of the people on the right who might be tempted towards UKIP. But we know that 80% of the public support the idea of reforming the human rights framework. So actually talking about that isn't going to aid in voters. Do, do you feel, on, I think some Tories do, do you feel particularly emotionally pained when you meet Tory voters who've now moved to UKIP in a way that you don't want to uh, well, I do engage, somewhat to their surprise, occasional sort of uh, email discussions with some of those who are. And I think, you know, what, what, what's different now? And the, my, my biggest message to those people is this. You know, we are now in a position where we are offering uh, a, a referendum, <coughs> that referendum on the EU. We are tightening up immigration. Immigration has been coming down. Theresa May is about to launch another big set of reforms on immigration. We're going to sort out the human rights issue. Um, so there isn't a reason not to vote for us uh, because of what you might be hearing from Nigel Farage and UKIP. But much, much, much more importantly is what you saw last week at the Labour Party conference. Now, we are now facing a left-wing, socialist, 1970s and 80s Labour Party that has very consciously gone back to the days of Neil Kinnock and Michael Foote. They haven't made any secrets about that. We were talking about it last week very clearly gone back to a trade union dominated Labour Party. They're starting to talk about some of the policies that made us the sick man of Europe you know, 30, 40 years ago. Uh, and we all know it would be disastrous for this country if they're allowed to put those into practice. And actually, those people who are naturally right-wing conservative supporters who might have wobbled a bit of late also know, because a lot of them are, are, are of an older generation who remember it very clearly, what happened to Britain in those years. And so one of the things we've got to get across very clearly in the next 18 months is what could happen to this country if we let them back into power. Now they've <coughs> taken a very deliberate decision that that's the path they're going to follow, and I think it would be disastrous for Britain. This thing about the Miliband and Cathy Henry crisis, there's no doubt it's hugely popular. And then also other people on the, on the right make the point that you know, there are only six energy companies. It does seem to be an oligopoly. How do you think on this whole sort of thing, how do you get more competition into these sectors? You know, what, what, what's the Tory answer to the fact that um, train fares, utility bills only seem to go one way? There doesn't seem to be a proper market competition work. Well, I mean, quite clearly. I mean, let, let, let's be clear that energy prices are a real challenge. Uh, they are having an impact. Uh, and you know, what we have to do is, is listen and take sensible steps. And in my personal view, is that the, the, the solution to our energy challenge is to move ahead as quickly as we can with the extraction of shale gas, which in the United States has had a transformational effect on the energy market, has led to much lower bills, has, has, you know, and it's long term. Um, it's not an artificial 18 month freeze, it's actually delivering long term energy reductions for the United States in a way that could happen here. So I feel very strongly we need to take a strategic view like that. Uh, and really press ahead with the development of what could be a real solution to our energy needs. Do you, do you feel frustrated, though, that, that, that one, one obvious Tory response would be to, to, to ease back on some of these green subsidies that are pushing bills up by more than £100? Are you, are you irritated that the Lib Dems are blocking any kind of action on that? Well, I, I think a smart energy policy has a bit of everything. Um, the truth is we cannot, in energy terms, put all our, all our eggs into one basket. <coughs> Uh, I am perfectly supportive of offshore wind. Uh, I don't want to see excessive development of wind power in our countryside. 
Uh, I think we need nuclear, new, new nuclear power stations. I think we need to exploit shale gas. What we need for the next generation or two is a mix of different energy sources uh, which can serve as needs at different moments, which can ensure that if something goes wrong in one sector, there's capacity in another sector. So a sensible energy strategy does a bit of everything. But in these green subsidies, if you were a Tory in the government, would you go in? Well, I think there is a place for renewables. Um, what, we're, what they can only be, though, is a part of what we do. They cannot be the dominant part of what we do. But the subsidies themselves in the, in the bills? Well, I mean, it depends. I mean, do, 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 I think it's, do I think, for example, the Green Deal is a good idea? I think the Green Deal is a very innovative policy uh, of a kind that, that makes a lot of sense, where people are actually investing in energy, energy efficiency through the savings they make in their bills from, from, from taking that step. So do I think that's a sensible policy? Yes, I do. Uh, I'm actually quite supportive of the expansion of uh, some of the forms of solar power. Um, so I think there's, it, there's, it, it's all about getting a mix. Um, what I'm, yeah, I'm very much of the view that we're probably, <coughs> in terms of onshore wind, uh, we've committed to a certain amount of expansion. I think we have to be pretty careful about, before, about choosing to do any more of that. Uh, my focus from now on will be on shale gas rather than more onshore wind. You were talking about health to buy and, and creating for more property owners, and, yeah. which is something that probably needs some more people voting for Tories. Um, but you also represent a, a, a kind of home county seat. Yeah. Are you in favour of doing we need to build more houses in this country in, 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 in seats like your own? I think it's unavoidable we need to build more houses, but we've got to be quite smart about where we build them and how we build them. Um, if you look around the country, there's still actually quite a lot of developable land, uh, which is either sitting with planning consent and waiting to be built, or, or where um, uh, it's very obvious that development would be fine. I mean, I could find patches of land in my own constituency where there is scope for some further development. What we've got to avoid doing, though, is changing the character of the southeast of England comprehensively by uh, building in the wrong way, by building in the wrong places, by unplanned expansion. We are going to need some more houses, we're going to need to be more innovative in housing provision, but I don't want us to do that in a thoughtless way where we just end up with sprawling in personal states, running estates, running across open countryside uh, in a way that changes the nature and character of some what are still the most, most attractive parts of the country. And um, on the next section, the cost of living is going to be you know, one of the really big issues for the next section. What would be looking? What would be your kind of one policy you'd like to see the Tory parties? Can you speak up, please? Sorry. We can't hear at the moment. Uh, what one policy on the cost of living would you like to see the Tory party have at the next election? Uh, good question. Well, I think my, 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 my answer to that would be rapid acceleration of shale gas exploitation because I think that's the thing that could make the biggest difference. I mean, it has reduced gas bills in the States massively. Uh, and I think that the, the sooner we accept that it is a, a powerful source of energy for the future of this country that can see us through the next few decades uh, and get on with it, the better. Um, it's obviously got to be done carefully. Uh, we already, you know, we've got extensive experience in this country of uh, the extraction of oil, the extraction of gas. We have some first-class, world-leading expertise. When the, um, uh, the, the, the EU looked at the whole issue of um, uh, the, the safety of oil exploration, you know, they accepted that we have a world-leading system of regulation here. So we need to have a world-leading system of supervision and regulation, but that doesn't mean we shouldn't get on with it. And you said to me, what's the biggest difference we could make <coughs> the cost of living in this country? It would be a sustained, not just on 18 months, but a sustained reduction in the cost of energy, which would help households, but also help keep jobs in this country. And um, you were one of only a couple of members of the Shadow Cabinet, uh, the, the, uh, straight after the last election, who expressed kind of reservations about offering the Lib Dems a referendum on AB in exchange for the coalition. If there is another Hong Kong, what, what, what role do you think the Tory party has in approving whether or not the Tories go into another coalition? Well, I don't, think we, I don't think we can afford to go there at the moment. I mean, I think you know, the, the Conservative Party has got to be absolutely, unequivocally single-minded about winning the next election. You know, the odds are too important for us. The, 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 the challenge this country would face if we're not successful, to my mind, is unthinkable. Letting Ed Miliband as Prime Minister would be unthinkable. So I don't think we should get into discussion at all about what would we do if we don't win. I think we've got to make absolutely certain we do win. So you think that, and, uh, and um, just on a, a final question before we throw it open to some questions from the floor. On, on a day-to-day -day <coughs> level, as a cabinet minister, how much does coalition impede you from doing what you would do if you were unconstrained by the Liberal Democrats? Well, I mean, on the ground, I have to say, we have a, 
good relations <laughs> between ministers. Um, Lord Tom McNally is the Minister of State for the Lib Dems in the Ministry of Justice. We got him very well. He's a, a great guy to work with. Uh, when we have differences of opinion, we argue them out between us, but actually we haven't had many differences of opinion. Uh, we occasionally have differences of policy emphasis, in which case he reaches sensible compromise. And I would genuinely say that it's been, a, you know, on the ground, it was the same in the Working Pensions Department with Steve Webb. We've had good collaborative relations. Of course there are differences of opinion. You know, we have differences over the ECHR, we have differences over the European Union. It is much better just to be honest and say, look, there are some areas where we're just not going to agree but actually there's a lot of areas where we're working together positively. And I can honestly say that there hasn't been very much that I've not been able to do, either as an employment minister or as employment minister or as Secretary of State for Justice. Um, uh, we've worked closely together, we've had some nuances changed around the edges, but generally speaking, the relationship has been pretty good. Brilliant, great. Well, let's have some questions from the floor. If you could just say your name and where you're from, and I'm seeing as how many hands have gone up, I'll take them in groups of three. So this gentleman here at the front, and that gentleman there, and then uh, that lady over there. I'd like to talk about justice. Mm -hmm. I'd like to talk about the fact that uh, so many people commonly involved with drugs, one way or another, are banned up, put away in prison for six, eight, ten weeks, not long enough to actually rehabilitate them, and then they're sent back without support to the localities in which they came from, to meet their pushes on the street. Could we think, please, about some method <coughs> of taking these people into rehab centres, boot camps, call it what you will, uh, which would uh, treat them sensibly, perhaps mind them for that much longer to make sure they were off their noxious substances, and then relocate them somewhere else safely so they don't meet the pushes every other day? I think this is a very okay. Yeah, and then that gentleman. Yeah, um, my name is Keith Sedgwick from Camden, party member. One month after a snowball fight with local kids, I was arrested and charged with assault. I went on to be acquitted and found innocent. However, I was appalled to learn that the cost of my defence would only half be met by the state because of reforms last year, which cap the cost that one can be reimbursed to that which would have been enjoyed by someone claiming legal aid. Is it fair that I live now in a country run by my party where an innocent person now has to pay out their own pocket to prove that they're innocent? And that would be that. Yes. Uh, Mr. Reilly, I really have a couple of questions. Thank uh, you. Just give it a one. Well, I'll <laughs> try and, yeah, we all, I think, would agree that prisons should not come out uh, without support, without monitoring. But what is it that persuades you that probation, who have achieved a gold standard for their work, are not fit to take, have the 70% that you're privatising next year and giving to a company called Serco, who have a reputation for doing unpaid work and tagging badly? In, incidentally, G4S, Serco, and Capita are another oligopoly, as well as the energy companies. Okay. Right, well, on those points, the, the first point is that uh, you're, you're absolutely right. Um, one of the things that I hope and expect to see from the change to the way we manage the release of prisoners, the through the gate system, in particular, the 12 month supervision period that follows, <coughs> this is a huge change. At the moment, those, those prisoners. Um, come out of jail, um, having spent a few weeks in jail with an addiction, and then there's nothing on the other side. Um, there will be a minimum period of 12 months for everyone, where they're supervised, where they are nurtured, mentored, uh, and one part of that has got to be to ensure that there is consistency in what happens in rehab before they leave prison and afterwards. Uh, when I was in Pentonville recently, one of the, um, the staff said to me, uh, actually one of our big frustrations <coughs> is that we can only really contain some of these drug habits in prison because we know perfectly well that when they leave, they won't follow through any kind of rehab. That will change now, and there will be, we will have the ability to require them to attend rehab after they've left prison in that supervision period. Jeremy Hunt and I are also trialling in the Northwest a, 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 a through the gate rehab system that actually has the same treatment starting in prison and continuing post prison. So I'm very acutely aware of that. On the cost of defence, um, the, the basic principle for the changes we're putting forward to, to legal aid will be 
if you have a disposable income um, after tax, after national insurance, after housing costs, after food, after council tax of more than £3,100 a month, then you will not be entitled to legal aid uh, unless you're found to be, yeah, to be innocent. The reason that we pay back at legal aid rates is what I can't do is pay for somebody who brings in the top QC. You know, a wealthy person, you know, uh, perhaps somebody who has um, been fortunate to get away with the decision they have, has lots of money in the bank, brings in the top barristers to help them get off. I cannot write a blank cheque to someone to say you can have whichever law you want, <coughs> however much they cost to defend you at the expense of the taxpayer. So you what I can do is make sure. What, what I person. can do, what I can do, is make sure that every person has the same right to the same amount of legal aid support as they would receive if they didn't have the means to pay for it themselves. And that's what we're doing. Um, on the probation issue, look, I mean, the first thing to say is we're not sacking the whole probation service. What we're doing is taking a part of the probation service that will move out of the public sector and get greater operational freedom uh, to do what, what, what works. There's a lot of talk about, about individual companies. You know, th this is not about handing over the support of prisoners to individual companies. Now, we're not picking a list and saying it's the business for these guys. I've been very clear in saying, actually, I'm not interested in just big organisations that have got no experience in this area. It's not a cost-saving exercise. It's about improving the level of the, 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 the effectiveness of our system in rehabilitating offenders. Now, there's some really good work done in our probation service. Um, but there's a lot of chat about probation meeting all of its targets and its goals. It is true that in terms of all the bureaucracies and all the systems and all the processes, most probation trusts do fine. There's only one problem, that is the reoffending level around this country are going up, not down. And that's what we've got to solve. Thank you. Uh, that gentleman's here. That gentleman's at the back. And we'll have that man back. Um, Lord Chancellor, my name is Andrew Rosemary. Mm -hmm. I'm the head of Barristers' Training. Mm -hmm. um, the previous government set up the legal ombudsman whose investigators are not required to have any qualifications at all and often have uh, no knowledge of basic law. This has been causing um, conscientious, hard-working lawyers and also members of the public lots of wasted time and a lot of injustice. Um, your government, Lord Chancellor, has given the legal ombudsman greater powers in spite of this. Uh, please can you reduce them uh, as long as it's staff and not legally qualified? Mm -hmm. Just at the back. Yeah, my name's Julian Corner. I'm uh, from the Lankelly Chase Foundation, <coughs> which is one of the investors in the Peterborough Social Impact Fund. <coughs> my question is, will this new uh, rehabilitation work, which is a significant additional task, attract additional resource? And I ask this because you have cited the Peterborough Civ as evidence for why uh, you want this, uh, uh, why you want short-term prisoners to be rehabilitated. But that attracted uh, significant additional resource to allow that to happen. Okay. Uh, my name is Ali Abbas. I'm a local resident here in Manchester. Um, I just wanted to come back on your uh, points around fracking, uh, shared asset fraction. They're making claims that will bring down prices, but all the evidence shows that in the UK it won't. Even Quadrilla, one of the big companies that's investing in shale gas, says it won't affect prices because it's part of the European market here in the UK. So it's not a very different situation to America. So um, I guess my question related to that is, um, if that's not relevant, so it actually clearly isn't because it's locking us into a long-term gas supply issue and making us uh, dependent on imported gas, then the question is, what are the alternatives? It would be better to spend our money on insulating homes so the that's out there around taking carbon taxes and using that for a national home insulation program that will really bring down prices for everybody and really cut the amount of energy we actually need in the first place rather than relying on technologies like fracking, which of course huge environmental issues and risk our water supplies. Okay. Right, well on that, look, on the legal ombudsman point, I'll take that on the board and go and take a look. Um, my, my, my view is that there is too much regulation in the legal services world. Um, I want to reduce it. Um, what I think, I mean, I, I think regulation should be there to stop bad guys doing bad things. Yes. Um, I don't think regulation should place ludicrous amounts of bureaucracy in the way of e efficient, um, sensible law firms. Um, we have already carried out a, a, an exercise, we did a call for evidence earlier in the year on ways in which we could simplify the regulatory framework without looking at the responses we had to that. But I'm very committed both in the short term and sort of setting the foundations for the longer term 
um, but both with, with, in areas that don't need legislation and areas that might, we might do, to try and make sure we get the right balance. I'm very sympathetic to, to what you say about the frustrations of the system, but on the specific point of the Ombudsman, I'll go and take a look more closely at that. Great. Um, Can I give you my details? Okay, please do. Yeah. Um, on Peterborough, I, I'd like to praise, I think the Peterborough model um, is the best example that we've got of what I'm trying to build in action. It has brought down, just in its first period, the reoffending rates for people it's working with by 5%, which is a really good start. <coughs> um, the, the Select Committee found that only about 25% of probation time is actually spent with a <coughs> Um, uh, if I look at the system we've got in place, it's very bureaucratic. And if I look at the relative costs, and I talked to the Peterborough team, the re relative cost of delivering what's been delivered in Peterborough and the cost of comparable support elsewhere, um, it, 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 the Peterborough team is doing it more efficiently. Now, I'm not trying to <coughs> save money um, here. What I'm trying to do is to, is to reinvest money by doing it more efficiently in the people getting no support at the moment. So I don't have extra cash. Um, but I am diverting many tens of millions of pounds from current spend into support for those people by making the system less bureaucratic, that's my goal. Um, and on the energy point, look, I think we need both. I'm strongly in favour of taking steps to improve energy conservation. Um, this is why we're spending money on the Green Deal, um, because, or why we, we, and why we've set up the Green Deal, because it actually encourages and supports people to take real steps, whether it's the installation of a state-of-the-art condensing boiler, whether it's uh, insulating their houses with double glazing or whatever. Only 12 people um, so far, though, isn't it? Sorry? Only 12 people so far, I heard. I think it's more than that now. Um, <coughs> I can't remember the story that said only 12 people started. That was before it had actually started. They were the people who signed up in advance. Uh, but look, uh, we, we need both. We clearly need to bring down energy usage. Uh, anything we can do to improve energy efficiency is, is good. But at the same time, we need more diverse so, so sources of energy <coughs> generation, and also ones that are in this country because it's an uncertain world and we can't afford for futures to be overly dependent on imports, in my view. Yeah, so, um, so that lady at the back, this gentleman here, <coughs> and then this gentleman here. Jackie Pendleton from um, down on the south coast, very in Sussex. Mm -hmm. uh, you talked, <coughs> Chris, about the offending rates going up mm -hmm. in terms of probation. However, down in Surrey and Sussex, reoffending rates are going down and um, ever since we were able to instigate the professional judgment project where probation officers um, are able to use the, their experience and their professionalism to make judgments rather than stick to bureaucracy, the reoffending rates have gone down. Very supportive of your rehabilitation, uh, transforming re rehabilitation project, but at the moment we are losing probation officers hand over fist because there is no detail about what's going to happen to them once we get to the split of CRCs and NPS, National Probation Service. Literally, it, you are putting at risk the whole system because we don't have enough professional probation officers to manage the offenders that are in place because nobody knows what's going on. There's no detail. Why so fast? I think I know the answer to that. But why aren't your advisors working faster to get this detail through? Because we are going to fall over if it doesn't speed up in terms of the process. Okay. Um, John Ashmore from Politics Time. Um, I just want to know how urgent you think the problem of declining party membership is given that there are more lobbyists and journalists here than Tories. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, it's Hi, I am Mark McDonald, I'm a criminal barrister. Um, my chambers collapsed last week. Mm -hmm. um, 10 members of staff have lost their jobs. Um, it's the chambers of Michael Mansfield. Mm -hmm. uh, we, um, uh, and it's only going to get worse uh, in the coming years with a further 17% reduction in money. But I don't expect any sympathy, particularly for Michael Mansfield, who's been a bit of a pain in the Government, mm -hmm. that's like the government of all governments. My point mm -hmm. is in relation to um, the Bill of Rights. Mm -hmm. You outlined with the Human Rights Act and the ECHR those areas and those decisions that you disagreed with mm -hmm. that caused you problems, um, <coughs> both ideologically and problematically. <coughs> with the Bill of Rights, which presumably would be drafted by the government, and those the government selects. 
Are you just going to pick out those rights that you dis you agree with and leave those rights that you disagree with? Therefore, it's probably not worth the paper at all. Okay. Right, um, on the probation officer's front, um, we've been going through quite a detailed process. <coughs> Since we launched the policy formally in May, uh, we've been through detailed discussions with the unions. Um, they have circulated plans for the, uh, the transition uh, as far as we got to the, the, the provisional agreement which they put to their national executive about <coughs> two weeks ago. They've circulated to all members. We've circulated details of our plans as part of the now 28-day consultation period to all probation staff. Uh, we have provided backup documents to all chiefs and chairs about the plans for transition uh, and we've been holding meetings across the country in the last few days to set out what happens next. I mean, I've been getting some, from some areas some quite positive feedback from people who are now saying actually we quite, quite like the idea of the independence we would have uh, with the, the community <coughs> with the companies. Um, but the question you say why so fast, I mean if you want a comparator um, when we set up the work program, we did it in 13 months. We're taking two and a quarter years to set this up. Um, and uh, I mean, I think that, you know, the, I don't believe this is a rush process. I think actually you create more unsettled, uh, more of an uh, unsettled state if you take longer than if you try and move it forward in a, in a steady way, which is what we're trying to do. But we're not trying to do it at a, a, a reckless pace, but we're trying to move it ahead at the, what we think is the right balance of pace. We've also, the various stages you just have to go through, you've got to sort things out with the unions, you've got to consult with staff, you then go through the process. But it, it, the aim is, in terms of the transition to the, um, the new structures, that you know, certainly this side, of, this side of Christmas everyone will know where they're going, um, and we'll have the chance to come back and say an appeal if they think it's been done wrongly. Um, on the declining membership, look, we've got 3,500 members here, uh, which I think is not a bad turnout at all. Um, it's a midweek conference, lots of people can't get away from work. Um, and I think you know, what you will find is that not everybody who is an active Conservative becomes a Conservative member. Um, I had a big event in my constituency <coughs> last weekend. I doubt if more than uh, a quarter of the people there were members, but they're all good supporters who will come along <coughs> and do things when time, times come. Um, and you know, of course we should do everything we can to, to strengthen the membership of the party, to build up the membership of the party, but there's a whole variety of different ways to get people involved. Grant Chap's work on Team 2015 Lots of people who want to campaign but don't want to sign up for the party. Um, lots of people want to support us on different campaigns but don't want to, to sign up as members of the party. And we just have to accept that involvement in a political party comes in, in different ways. Um, on, on your point on, just if I might be slightly mischievous on the Michael Mansfield, <laughs> I, 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 did, I did note that the Michael Mansfield chambers appear to have reinvented themselves in a, in a shared office suite with the, uh, the, 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 the chamber's fees having come down by half. They have. Um, and so, you know, to be honest, I would applaud you for that. You know, one, one of the things, you know, I know it's difficult, you know, I didn't want to come and do this job and make wholesale changes to legal aid, but the financial and budgetary pressures mean we have no choice. And it does throw the gauntlet down to people like you, so the solicitors say, find ways of doing things more cost effectively, and you know, hats off to you for finding a way of doing things more cost effectively. In terms of the rights, one of the things important to say, if you look back at the original convention, written in the 1940s, I think most people in this room would struggle to find very much in it they disagreed with. The issue is not about the core convention, just how it has become interpreted and reinterpreted and re-reinterpreted. It actually contains a balance of rights and responsibilities, it contains safeguards for the state, it contains safeguards for individuals. Um, it is not the convention itself, the text of the original convention that is the problem, it is the way that the European Court of Human Rights has interpreted it, reinterpreted, applied it to areas where the originators never intended it to be, but like it. So do you think we're going to get better interpretation from British judges than from foreign judges? Well, uh, uh, it's certainly a very different process when you're up with 17 people taking a decision from across Europe, some of whom are not judicially qualified, mm -hmm. taking a decision than in our own <coughs> Supreme Court, which I think, um, I think our own Supreme Court is a blue chip standard for any justice system around the world. Um, but what I'd say is that in terms of the detail, we <coughs> to see what we come up with. But, but I would always say the problem is not the convention text, it is the way that the court now interprets it. Just, just on, on that point, one of the big controversies is right to a family life being used by um, uh, criminals or foreign nationals to avoid deportation. Um, do you think, is your view that anyone, uh, any um, foreign national who commits a crime in this country should be liable to deportation? You know, or uh, if not that, what level of family life uh, gives them a 
a right in inverted commas to say here. I mean, obviously it's not the cat, as Theresa May said, um, a year or two ago. You know, is it being married? Is it having children here? What, what, what's your view on that question? I think there can't be a single answer to that because ultimately it's always going to be down to a court to judge on an individual case. I think Parliament has to set some expectations, and I'm sure that's, well, that, that, that is what Theresa will be seeking to do. Um, but look, I, I think what, above all, people want is a, an element of common sense to be applied to all of this. Now, that element of common sense actually did exist in the wording of the original convention. It provided lots of caveats. Um, it would say, you know, where it's the interest of the state. There is even uh, an as yet unratified um, provision of the state that says you can divorce anybody you want uh, without process if they represent a national security threat. Um, but the, the, the reality is that what we have in the European Court of Human Rights is a jurisprudence without limit. So effectively what we've done, it, it, in, in the courts in this country, if our Supreme Court reaches a decision on UK law that Parliament does not believe represents the will of the people, Parliament then has the ability to pass a new law that changes the law as appropriate. And I always take my view is my position as Lord Chancellor <coughs> is not to look at a decision taken in the UK court and say the judge got that wrong. Um, I, you know, I, judges take decisions every day of the week, up and down the country. Every now and then they get one wrong, but mostly they're wise and sensible. And if Parliament doesn't like the decisions they take, Parliament needs to change the law accordingly. In the European Court of Human Rights, with an unlimited jurisprudence, you don't have that freedom. And that's, to my mind, the central question. You know, this is a process that can just can continue ad infinitum. The court can decide whatever it wants to decide is a human rights issue. And that's where I think the problem comes. When I talk about limiting the role of the court, that's really what we've got to do. We've got to stop being part of an unlimited jurisprudence. That is taking away powers from our parliament to decide in areas like prisoner voting, um, uh, in the case that nearly went wrong over political advertising. Okay, I'm going to take one last round of questions. Uh, so I have this gentleman <coughs> here, um, that gentleman there, and <coughs> we'll have that gentleman in the check shop at the back. I wanted to ask about uh, Liam Ormott and uh, do criminal justice policy for the Catholic Church. Um, I wanted to ask about the withdrawal of legal aid from prison treatment cases. Mm -hmm. uh, you've indicated that you'd like to see more complaints about treatment in prison go through the internal complaint system, although legal aid is already only accepting cases that can't be um, dealt with through that internal complaint system. We've obviously got um, a much better record uh, for prisoner treatment than a lot of countries, but there are still issues around overcrowding. Uh, almost 90 officers last year dismissed or disciplined for um, mistreatment of prisoners. And can you guarantee that um, under these changes, no prisoner will be left without recourse when dealing with such issues? Um, Neil Hazel from the University of Salford. Um, you're absolutely right in spotting that um, uh, uh, resettlement is a key issue with. Um, prisoners, including young, young people, of course, as, as, as you'll know, and I'm aware you've got a, a bill coming up on, on that. Um, it seems that there might be an opportunity to really listen to the research and to focus on resettlement as an aim of prison for young people right from the beginning. Yeah. Um, is that a possibility? And also, how do we get people outside to play ball? Because we know what's crucial is the health services, the housing services, education services, rather than necessarily these justice services play ball. H how do we make sure that they do that? Okay. Yeah, Councillor Craig McKinney, I was the Police and Crime Commissioner candidate for Kenton. Thanks for the help you gave me last year. We were sadly unsuccessful. Commiserations. Thank you. Um, now I'm magistrate as well, and <coughs> particularly drugs are, uh, the, well, it, it's something that you see, just a complete uh, cycle of reoffending uh, based on drugs. So something that's very concerning to me. And as part of the PCC campaign, I went to a, a charity where they were trying to rehabilitate drug offenders. And all of them, to a, a man and woman, were saying about the, the free availability of drugs in our prisons. And as a magistrate, we, we often it's the last resort to say, well, at least we're going to protect the public and the shopkeepers for even a short time of 12 weeks or more from this type of offending. But you're left with really the taste that you're actually perhaps making it worse for these offenders by putting them in a place where, where drugs are freely available. Now, what is clear is that we do need a, a grown-up debate on drugs, and I don't think we've really had that yet. But we have this very strange situation that the police locally are up in arms about. We have a proliferation of these skunk workshops which I think do need primary legislation against them, where you can actually buy uh, cannabis seeds legally <laughs> and grow them, obviously, is what is done, but yeah. the actual buying of the seeds is, is not an illegal act. And 
well, we, we're not having the grown ups vote about drugs, and I think it's one that he's, he's happy. Um, on the withdrawal of legal aid in prisons, I mean, uh, there are two parts to, um, to my mind about legal support in prisons. If it is a matter of the length of your sentence, the amount of time if you're going to spend in prison, then it's right and proper that we should provide you with access to a lawyer through legal aid. But for other complaints about prisons, we have both um, the obviously immediate complaints complaints within the prison. We have a complaint system, and then we've got a prison's ombudsman. Uh, and you, know, you just have to ask yourself the question: At what point do you draw the line? Once you've been through all of those, are we still paying for a lawyer on top of that at a time of scarce resource? Um, uh, yes, and you, you, you highlight that there are occasional incidents in our prisons where things go wrong. But the truth is, overwhelmingly, our, our prison system stands in comparison with anything, any, 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 any system anywhere in the world. And when we talk about overcrowding in our prisons, it means two prisoners sharing a cell, very occasionally three. If you go to many other parts of Europe, ten is the norm. Um, you know, we have a thoroughly decent prison system that looks after people who have committed crimes in a way that I think is, is a reasonable balance between punishment and support for people who often come from very difficult backgrounds. Um, but what I don't think we need to do is to pump resource, millions of pounds a year, into funding lawyers, uh, a, a, legal, a section of the legal industry that specialises in doing this, in trying to find prisoners who can lodge complaints and then actually work with them. I think we've got a competent, solid ombudsman who can reach decisions uh, perfectly well. We have a com complaint system. We'll make sure both of those are up to the job. But I think it's really important you draw the line somewhere. On the resettlement of young people, I completely agree. There's two parts to this. The <coughs> crucial element of the, the, the reforms um, involves the re reorganisation of our prison system. At the moment, I don't know what the figure is for Manchester. I should have, should have looked it up, I suppose. But for London, we release up from 114 prisons into London. You can't do a proper resettlement from 114 prisons around the country into London. So we're designating about 78 um, prisons around the country as resettlement prisons for their own local areas, where almost every prisoner will spend the last few months of their sentence, or the whole of their sentence, if it's a short sentence, so that we can do the proper through the gates area, the people who are going to be working with them after they leave, starting working with them before they leave. I think that will make a difference. On the young people front, though, at a particular point, we'll be making an announcement during the autumn about how we're going to move further on the education front. I want to completely reshape the way we detain young people in, in our justice system. So it is more about education with detention than detention with education. So we're looking at creating secure colleges that are much more of an educational experience, much more uh, in terms of education hours each week, and a focus on trying to build skills amongst young people who turn up in, in custody having got almost none at all. So more to come on that shortly, which I hope you'll look at and say that seems sensible. Um, on drugs in prisons, look, it's a constant problem. Uh, mm -hmm. and it's not one we, should, we, we have alone. Other countries do too. I went to the, the main prison in Berlin, and they showed me some of the techniques that I use to smuggle drugs into prisons. Yeah, they're you quite unsafe. Hollowed out, hollowed out, hollowed out, hollowed out champagne, shampoo bottles. Yeah. In the middle of it, you'll find a, a cache of drugs. In this country, the, 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 we've had tennis balls and dead animals thrown over prison walls stuffed with drugs. Mm -hmm. It is a huge criminal effort to get drugs into our prisons. Um, and it's something we're constantly working against, and, it, it, and it's not easy, and what you describe is not acceptable. Though I think it has got a bit better. Technology is better now, there's better swabbing technology. Um, but I mean, the, the, the truth is, prisoners will go quite a long way to conceal drugs uh, in jails. Um, on skunk workshops, it's a very good point. I'll talk to Theresa May, it's probably her legislative area, not mine, but it's a very sensible point. Drugs have come up a lot. Um, we know that Jeremy Brown, who's a Lib Dem minister in the Home Office, is, is examining a kind of what uh, he, he himself was a kind of possible relaxation of drug laws. Mm -hmm. um, is that something that you would be opposed to? But I think um, it, 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 there are strong arguments on both sides of this, but the people I tend to listen to are those who see the impacts on the ground. Friends who are doctors say to me they, they see, I and mean, even cannabis, the argument should we legalize cannabis? Uh, many friends who are doctors have said to me they see the impact in mental health terms of extended cannabis use. And I remember going to, three or four years ago, going to an estate in North London, um, where, uh, walking around with one of the youth workers who said actually the impact <coughs> of the skunk in that two case on this estate is completely disastrous. Mm. You just see individuals falling apart mentally as a result of using it. So uh, I am not in favour of relaxing the rules. I think you just see the healthcare impacts. It is a difficult challenge uh, to, to combat change behaviour, but actually if we accept defeat, 
but then the consequences could be much more broad ranging. And, um, and one uh, final question. Prisoner voting. Mm -hmm. um, this is obviously one of the things that has mm -hmm. kicked off the kind of European Court of Human Rights saying prisoners yeah. should be allowed to vote. <coughs> um, are you confident that Britain will be able to hold the line on that? That there will be no, there won't be prisoners voting kind of in any British election? Well, there's certainly, it's an area where there are lots of pressures coming. There's a case under consideration in the Supreme Court at the moment. Um, there is the, the issue of the Euro European Court of Human Rights. The, um, uh, the, the current position is that we have said to Parliament, um, we have been instructed by the court in Strasbourg to give prisoners a vote, um, so we're offering you a choice. You can either accept giving the prisoners the vote if they go to jail for four years or less, uh, six months or less, or you can say the court in Strasbourg, no. Um, and whereas the, the, the legal position is that we are, as a government and as an executive, obliged to fulfil international treaties, but as the Attorney, Attorney General has advised, Parliament has the right to say it will not accept this. Um, and so at the moment it's sitting before Parliament to say, do you want to accept it or not? Um, uh, the last time Parliament expressed a view, which was <laughs> three or four years ago, on a, a, not a binding motion, just an indicative motion, I think the vote was about 450 to 20. So it's going to be an interesting debate when time comes. <laughs> <laughs> but let's say Parliament says no. Let's say it goes back again to the European Court and they say, no, you do have to give prisoners a vote. Mm -hmm. Would you be prepared to defy the court, pay the fines, whatever? Um, rather than give prisoners a vote? Well, I think that in the terms of the time frame where we are, we'll either be in power after the election, renegotiating, sorting all this out, um, <coughs> even whatever option we choose, um, in which case the issue becomes one that is part of an overall package of change, and I would not in that situation be expecting to walk out the other side having been obliged to give prisoners the vote. Or alternatively, we will not have won, in which case it will be Mr Miliband's choice, and well, good luck to him. But uh, I'm rather working on the assumption and the hope that the former is the case rather than the latter, that we will renegotiate, we'll leave, we will recast whatever final version we come up with for um, our future relationship with the European Court of Human Rights, the Human Rights Legal Framework in the UK, and that that will deal with this issue once and for all. Well, Chris Grady, um, uh, thank you very much for the time.